Mr. Frank DeMauro. Thanks, Vinny. Nice. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Excellent. Love to see the big crowd. So I had about five minutes in the exhibit hall this morning before I came to get prepared for my talk, and uh, I cannot wait to go back. I can't promise my wife I won't be bringing home a new telescope, but <laughs> it's pretty impressive there. Uh, that video you just saw um, was, was actually um, really reminded me of my first introduction to astronomy when I was, uh, so I grew up 21 miles from here in Maywood, New Jersey in Bergen County. Um, I am a child of New Jersey public schools and as Vinnie mentioned, I'm a proud graduate of Rutgers University, uh, received my degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, and I have been in the space business ever since I graduated uh, in 1980 something, uh, that's not important. Uh, but my first introduction to astronomy was back in seventh grade. Mrs. Williams, our science teacher, had us uh, make a very small handheld refract uh, refracting telescope, sort of like what the uh, pirates would use. And as that video showed, the first real celestial body I observed with it was the moon. And anybody who has done anything in astronomy can attest that the moon is an absolutely fantastic celestial body to observe with any sort of magnification device, binoculars, whatever. Uh, and so I always tell people who are just starting to get into astronomy, that's the first thing they should look at. And from there, uh, that following uh, Christmas, I got a Sears three-inch Newtonian reflector telescope made of cardboard and plastic. And in that same house where I grew up in Maywood, I observed for the first time after figuring out how to use it and reading all the astronomy books, uh, Jupiter. And that was magnificent, but what was even more magnificent was the night I could on a very clear night, which was a little odd for, uh, for that part of uh, Bergen County because of the light pollution, but I was able to actually see the tiniest dots of light in the moons of Jupiter, and that, that was it. I, um, I uh, eventually graduated, so to speak, to a four and a half inch uh, Newtonian reflective telescope, which is what I have now, but uh, I'm gonna be looking later what, uh, what I might be able to, to take home. So I'm going to uh, talk today about um, the, the Cygnus program and the commercial resupply services program that we do at Orbital ATK. We are one of two uh, American companies right now that are bringing cargo to the International Space Station um, for NASA. There will be a third participant, uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, joined us uh, when they uh, became a participant as part of the, the follow-on uh, CRS-2 contract. CRS is Commercial Resupply Services. SpaceX is the other company that delivers cargo uh, like Orbital ATK does. I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of Cygnus and about the Antares rocket uh, and also about the launch pad from Wallops Island um, and, and just give you a little bit of sense of, of what it was like uh, being part of that. Uh, for the past year, I've been the general manager of the Advanced Programs Division within our Space Systems Group, but for six years prior to that, I managed uh, this, this program, the Cargo Resupply Program and the Cygnus uh, Satellite Program. So uh, it's a real, uh, real uh, source of pride for me to be part of uh, human exploration, human spaceflight, and, and things like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, talk through a little bit about the company. Uh, Orbital Sciences Corporation uh, was uh, an entity prior to two years ago uh, that merged with Alliant Tech Systems, ATK, two companies that have been in the aerospace business uh, for many years. So, so we, we formed Orbital ATK. We are about 12,000 employees around the country. I think we're in 17 states right now. Um, and it is a, it is a company devoted to aerospace and defense uh, businesses. So uh, what you can see behind me here is a bit of a description of what we do. So we have three main business areas. We have the flight systems group, which does launch vehicles, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. We have a defense group, which uh, primarily supports the Department of Defense, and then we have my group, uh, the, uh, the, the space systems group. So we have been building satellites uh, as part of Orbital ATK and all the predecessor companies for many years now. Um, you can see over 165 delivered spacecraft of various, uh, various sizes. We have 95 additional ones in production um, across the country. Um, my group, the Advanced Programs Division, is where we house our human spaceflight 
uh, group, the Cygnus vehicle, uh, but we also do uh, space logistics where we do life extension of geosynchronous spacecraft, uh, which is part of our roadmap to eventually putting robotics in space for refueling uh, satellite repair, uh, satellite observation, and eventually being able to transfer spacecraft around uh, Earth orbit um, uh, using sort of, like a, sort of like a space tug. So this is just a summary of some of our customers. You can see on the uh, upper left there, NASA, one of our biggest customers. Of course, they're the customer for the uh, Commercial Resupply Services Program. But we have customers around the world. Uh, we have universities. We have governments. We have uh, private companies around the world. We do all sorts of types of, of, uh, of spacecraft. And you can see here, uh, this is the flight systems group. Um, and some of the products they have. The, the, one of the more um, notable ones right now is we are building the solid rocket motors that are going to be part of the Space Launch System, SLS. Um, that is done at our facility in, in Utah, and those, those solid rocket motors are actually derived from the, the motors we built for um, the Space Shuttle many years ago. Uh, if you look in the upper left, you can see the, uh, the rocket taking off there. That's the Pegasus rocket. That's an air launch rocket that was dropped first from a B-52 and then eventually we modified it to drop to our own, from our own L-1011. It was the first commercially, uh, completely commercially developed rocket uh, we launched, have launched and continue to launch many uh, spacecraft for NASA. It's, it is a small launch vehicle, but it's perfect for small Earth observing spacecraft uh, as well as other uh, spacecraft that observe other galaxies uh, in the solar system. Uh, the uh, medium class launch vehicles you see uh, next to the right uh, is really the Antares rocket, which uh, we developed initially to become a medium lift vehicle, which eventually became the launch vehicle for uh, Cygnus and for the CRS program. Uh, we are actually starting to embark in uh, even bigger launch vehicles. We just announced it last week at the National Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, our development of our next generation launcher, which is a, a launch, fit, launch vehicle family, which uh, is starting to grow in size. And we also build some composite structures for both the uh, military but also commercial use. In our space systems group, uh, this, is the, this is the best group. Um, I'm not really biased there, but that's just a fact. Uh, so we build all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of spacecraft. So in the upper left, you can see commercial spacecraft. So anyone who gets DirecTV or DISH Network, uh, anyone who has tape cable television, most of those satellite signals uh, go over, uh, over satellite. And we have built many uh, commercial communication spacecraft for uh, customers around the world as well as in the United States. And uh, I was part of that group for, for several years before I went into the, the Cygnus program. And that's the kind of spacecraft that uh, it's out in geosynchronous orbit and it's life limited uh, by fuel primarily. Uh, typically the technology uh, doesn't get old and the hardware lasts a lot longer than it's designed for, but it runs out of fuel because it has to be station kept extremely precisely. So there's another vehicle we're starting to build on the, on the bottom left, which is the um, mission extension vehicle. And it's the first phase of our satellite, space logistics and satellite servicing uh, roadmap where we're gonna fly those spacecraft out into the geo belt. And the customers that are out there that have perfectly working satellites that are about out of fuel where they would normally have to push them out into the graveyard orbit and launch a whole new spacecraft. We can rendezvous with that spacecraft, dock with the back of the spacecraft, and become sort of a jetpack and keep that spacecraft alive. So now that operator can continue to use that spacecraft uh, and, um, and not have to get rid of it and launch a new one. So uh, that's called the mission extension vehicle. And as I mentioned, that, that's part of a roadmap for all sorts of satellite servicing. Uh, programs that we, uh, we plan to embark on. Uh, we have built a lot of Earth-observing uh, spacecraft, uh, space-observing spacecraft, like the Galax spacecraft. Um, uh, Landsat 9 is a program we're building right now, follow-on to other Landsat spacecraft. Uh, we built the Orbcom constellation for low data rate communications uh, that is still in use today, where companies like Caterpillar can put a transmitter receiver on their equipment, which is extremely expensive all around the world, and they can track where that equipment is uh, at any time, uh, day or night, and, and find out how it's operating. They can, they can collect all sorts of telemetry. Um, over to the far right on the, on the upper slide, that's the GSAP spacecraft. That is a, a satellite observing spacecraft we build uh, for the government. That's, uh, we just launched a couple more 
uh, not that long ago, and that's been a very, it's a small geospacecraft, but, uh, but very successful. On the, uh, you, you can see the picture there of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we, have, we obviously didn't build the Hubble Space Telescope. What we have done, though, over the years is played a major role in the servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, both the orbital, legacy orbital company and the legacy ATK company did all sorts of logistics work. We built the tools, many of the tools that were used to um, swap out the electronics and the optics as part of the Hubble repair missions. Uh, and so we're, we're really proud to have been part of that, which uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, anyone would realize is just a, a tremendous observatory. Uh, we're all excited about James Webb getting launched next year, uh, but I think we'll all have a special place in our hearts for uh, the Hubble mission. Um, on the bottom right, we launch a lot of balloon uh, missions now for, uh, for NASA. We have a team out in New Zealand waiting for the winds to, to die down to launch another balloon uh, as soon as they can for a high altitude observation. Um, and then uh, you can see over here, we build a lot of components, solar arrays, tanks, structures for spacecraft and, and otherwise. The pride of the fleet is this vehicle up here. That's the Cygnus Cargo resupply vehicle and uh, what we'll spend most of our time talking about uh, today. So a little bit about commercial resupply services. So um, as good scientists and engineers, we'll, we'll break down the problem. Um, so International Space Station, um, pretty big. Uh, you can see it's uh, slightly bigger than a football field when you factor in the solar rays and thermal radiators and things like that. Uh, this was especially important now this year with the Super Bowl being in Houston. Um, everyone wanted to talk about the International Space Station in relation to the size of a football field, and there you go. So even though uh, weight doesn't matter too much, but it is a million pounds of mass that has to get moved around. It's in a 400-kilometer-ish orbit, which means there's a reasonable amount of drag from the atmosphere, so it needs to be reboosted. And so if you, if you think about the problem of of having to, how to keep a space station flying. I won't get into how it was built. That was uh, quite a feat in and, of, in and of itself. But if you think of the problem of how you need to keep it flying and how you need to uh, support its use for what it's meant to be, which is a national laboratory, uh, and to conduct all sorts of scientific experimentation, you figure out, OK, what do we need to do to, to, to keep this thing flying? Uh, there are over 100 systems uh, and payload racks on the International Space Station. Um, it has an, about an acre of solar rays, which are still operating extremely well. Uh, the batteries on the space station were just swapped out uh, as part of the uh, JAXA mission. Uh, they launched their HTV resupply mission. Uh, they did a battery swap out, so it's nice and healthy. But you also have to think of it in terms of, the obviously, the humans on board. So, the internals of the space station are roughly the same as about the size of volume of a five-bedroom house. And you've got six people living there, living and working and doing, and doing what they do. And so we need to get them food. We need to get them clothing. We need to get them water. Even though they do recycle things on the station for water, they do need uh, to supplement the water. Um, they need supplies like laptops and printers and printer paper, which is quite very heavy to put in the cargo module, but they need that. Uh, they need medical supplies just in case. And they need the scientific experiments to, to be able to get out of the International Space Station what it's intended to. And so that's where we come, we come in. Uh, so then the, the job is put to, to us and, and other companies to figure out how we're going to get those supplies up there. The number one priority for any vehicle going to the International Space Station is safety. It is intoler intolerable for any vehicle to cause damage to the space station or even worse. And so that's the number one. Number two is mission success. You absolutely need to get there. They need the food. They need the supplies. They, they obviously keep uh, uh, enough stores on board uh, in case something happens, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, but safety and then mission success. Everything after that. Um, is really up to us to figure out how it's going to get there. So what did, what did this mean? So NASA embarked on going about cargo resupply in a different way than they may have in the past. In the past, they might have uh, done it everything on their own, built the spacecraft. They would own the spacecraft, that type of thing, and have sort of a, uh, a, 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 sort of a larger approach to things, um, the way NASA would normally do things. Well, they changed their their ways on this, on this approach. They wanted it to be commercial. 
and they wanted it to be service-oriented. And what that means is that NASA does not own the Cygnus spacecraft, Orbital ATK does. They don't own the Dragon spacecraft, SpaceX does. What they do is they pay us to perform a service and bring that cargo up and we'll get paid based on how well we perform that service. And what that also meant is a different way of doing things in which NASA was investing in companies, not just paying the companies. If you look at the pie chart, um, so if, if you look on the left there, we have three components of how we're going to get the cargo to the space station. You've got Antares, the rocket. You've got to launch it from somewhere, Wallops Island. And then you need to have the spacecraft to bring the cargo up, and that's the Cygnus spacecraft. If you look at the pie chart on the right, you can see where the investment came from. Orbital ATK invested more than half the money than the government did. And we knew that going in. That was a, a commercial venture we wanted to be involved in, and so we invested that much money. You can see NASA invested that much money. And MARS, which is, stands for the Mid-Atlantic Mid Regional Spaceport, uh, which is part of the Virginia uh, Space Flight Authority, Commercial Space Flight Authority, uh, everybody put in a certain amount of money to create this system. So this is what we would call a public-private partnership and how, and in, a, in a way that, uh, that supports government use. So a little bit of background, how we, they, they furthered that. In um, uh, 2006, NASA put out a competition to, to get companies to win the, the privilege of investing in this system. And uh, we didn't win first time around. SpaceX won, and a company called Rocket Plane Kistler won. Uh, but Rocket Plane Kistler had some troubles along the way, and so eventually NASA realized they might not make it. And so they canceled the contract, recompeted uh, that second contract, and, uh, and, we, and we won that contract. And, to, and so in February 2008, we embarked on the development of the Cygnus spacecraft. Uh, I should point out the Antares launch vehicle was already in orbital ATK's plans as a medium-class launch vehicle. So Antares had started. Uh, Cygnus uh, did not. Also interestingly is only nine months after, or ten months after we started the development of Cygnus, we also won the operational contract for commercial resupply services, CRS contract. And so we initially won a, eight missions. We're now up to 11 missions on the contract. Um, and so that's how Orbital ATK got into the human spaceflight business and cargo resupply. Just a couple of pictures to show you the, uh, the Wallops uh, flight facility launch pad. Uh, the larger picture here, uh, you can see the water tower. I'm told that's the tallest water tower uh, east of the Mississippi. I'll believe it. Um, you can see uh, the, uh, this was actually a, a test article of Antares before we actually started launching the rocket on the actual pad. There's the flame trench that the, the first stage fires, all the flames come out and go towards the ocean. Uh, and then over here, you've got uh, the liquid fuel farm. Uh, so Antares, which I'll show you in a minute, is a liquid first stage rocket and a solid upper stage. So we had to build the infrastructure to be able to load liquid oxygen and, um, uh, uh, sorry, kerosene uh, into the rocket. We also used, reused some existing NASA facilities uh, H-100 is where we process the spacecraft and load the cargo. Uh, V-55 is where we fuel the spacecraft with the hydrazine and oxidizer. And then the horizontal integration facility is where the Antares vehicle is integrated and tested and where Cygnus is eventually mated. And then it, it will roll out when it's all done out these doors, come down this road, up the concrete uh, pad horizontally, and then it will uh, be transported to the vertical position for launch. The Antares launch vehicle itself, as I mentioned, it is a hybrid liquid and solid um, rocket vehicle. The first stage is liquid. Once the first stage uh, is uh, depleted, uh, then it will separate, and then we actually light off the solid upper stage um, up here. So here you've got liquid oxygen tank. You've got the RP-1, uh, which is really kerosene. It just it stands for rocket propellant one. Those are loaded into the vehicle uh, the day of launch, a few hours before launch. And um, the, when, the, when the rocket takes off, it uh, puts off a, about, uh, in its current configuration, about 900,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, when it's further optimized for CRS-2, uh, then it'll, it'll put off uh, over a million pounds of thrust. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful rocket. Um, 
You can see the payload up here inside the fairing, Cygnus spacecraft, of course, and then the solid motor here, which is actually built by our uh, sister division out in Utah, uh, the Castor 30 XL. Um, this rocket, the Antares rocket, can put a fully loaded Cygnus spacecraft into an orbit about 190 kilometers in altitude. Um, and that's by, not only by the rocket capability, but that's by design, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. We've had several variants of, of uh, uh, the Antares rocket. Uh, the biggest change of note uh, that I should mention are the engines. Uh, we originally started this program with uh, engines that were referred to as AJ-26 engines, which were actually older Russian engines. Originally, they were NK-33s. Um, and as some of you might know, uh, we had a launch failure in uh, October of 2014, uh, and we, uh, we lost the mission. And so as part of the recovery plan, we swapped out the engines for an RD-181 engine from uh, Energomash in Russia. Uh, so that's the rocket uh, that we fly right now. The combination of those new Russian engines and a bigger solid motor gave Antares the lift capability of the bigger Cygnus vehicle, and we'll talk about that as well. So, okay, so we've got a rocket, we've got a launch pad, we've designed the spacecraft, we've filled it with cargo, uh, whatever NASA wants us to put in there, now we've got to get it to the International Space Station. So we launch, we get dropped off about 190, 200 kilometers, depending on the launch vehicle. Uh, we like that altitude of the initial orbit because we have to, at that point, begin the process of phasing ourselves to not only raise the altitude to the 400 kilometers that the, where the space station is, but we have to get to that point at the same, um, at the same point in space. And so if we're at 200 kilometers, when the space station's at 400 kilometers, we catch up very quickly or relatively quickly. If we actually launched into a much higher orbit, if we launched into a 350 kilometer orbit and we weren't very close to the space station, it would take us a long time to catch up. While we have scientific payloads and time-sensitive payloads on the spacecraft, we don't want to take that much time. So we launch at, into a lower orbit, we catch up more quickly, and a, over time, we continue to raise the orbit. It typically takes us anywhere from a day and a half to three days to close that gap, not only an, uh, on an angular basis, but also from an al altitude basis. We get about 1,000 kilometers below the space station, so now it's right below us. We're just, we're 1,000, uh, sorry, meters, 1,000 meters below the space station. And now we start making our way up. That's called the R bar, R for radius, towards the radius of the Earth. Um, and we start making our way up the, uh, up the R bar slowly and very safely. We have a suite of uh, sensors on board the spacecraft which detect where they are in relation to the spacecraft at all, the t at all time using a combination of laser scanners, which detect, uh, which work with reflectors on the space station. We have another sensor which actually knows the shape of the space station and it measures how big it is, and we know how close we are based on that. And then we use the GPS system. We actually do relative GPS. We compare the GPS uh, solution that we get on the spacecraft with the GPS solution that the ISS has, and we know about how far we are away. So we use those three things to make our way slowly up towards the space station. We get to about 250 meters below, and we stop. Then we assess how is the spacecraft's health, how is the ISS's health, is everybody happy? We'll continue to move from that point to 30 meters below and stop again. And once everybody's happy, we make our final approach to the space station where we get to about 10 meters below, about 30 feet. Uh, the robotic arm comes out. The crew on board will grapple us in the back of the spacecraft and eventually move us and connect us to the, to the space station. Uh, we are up there for any period of time. It can range from a couple of weeks to, to a few months. Uh, this next mission we're about to fly, we expect to be on the station about 90 days. Um, when we're done, the arm will grapple us, pull us away from the space station, let us go, and we'll fly away. And we will either directly re-enter over uh, the Pacific Ocean, or we'll go off and do some more scientific experiments, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. So that's, that's essentially how Cygnus gets from the rocket to the space station and eventually uh, ends the mission. So the, the, the sp pictures here, um, I'll start on the right. So uh, we designed Cygnus just because that's the way we do things, to be compatible with multiple launch vehicles. Well, we never had intended to not fly on Antares, but after Antares failed, we had to get flying again. And the flexibility of the spacecraft being able to fly on multiple launch vehicles meant we could quickly integrate ourselves with an Atlas V rocket from the United Launch Alliance and keep the cargo flowing 
while the Antares team figured out what went wrong and how to fix it. So we actually have launched twice so far on Atlas, then we launched on Antares. This next mission will launch on Atlas again, um, and that was an agreement we worked out with NASA to get them a little bit more cargo. Atlas V does have a higher lift capability than, uh, than Antares, and uh, NASA needed the cargo. So that's why you see we have two launch vehicles there, because we can actually fly on either one. But over to the right, this is, this is the Cygnus. It has two main parts. It has the cargo module. And this is back to, okay, how do we solve the problem? Let's break the spacecraft down a little bit. So we need a place to put the cargo. That's the cargo module. We buy that from a company called Talos Alenia Space in Italy. Why? Because they have built most of the modules that are on the space station. They know space. They know international space station interfaces. And so that was the lowest risk, best approach we could, we could, uh, we could pick for NASA. Then we have the service module. That's what we build at Orbital ATK in our facility in Dulles, Virginia, which uh, integrates components from all around the country and, quite frankly, all around the world. The solar rays you see here, these circular solar rays that unfurl like a fan, those are built by our facility in Goleta, California. This structure, the service module structure, is built by our facility in San Diego, California. And the tanks that you can't see that are inside that hold the propellant are built by our facility in Commerce, California. Uh, a lot of the sensors are built, uh, we, we fly a, a, what's called a LIDAR, a laser range uh, uh, system from uh, Germany. We also fly one from Canada. We fly a star tracker uh, from Sardin in France. We have GPS um, uh, antennas from the United States. Orbital ATK builds a lot of the avionics ourselves. So within that service module, even though we have all the cargoes in here, we needed something to do the flying. We needed something to generate the power, to store the power when we don't have energy on the solar arrays. The propulsion systems, the computing systems that take all those sensors data, figuring out where you are in space and telling the, the propulsion system which thrusters to fire and for how long to guide the spacecraft exactly where we want it to go. And that's all done on the spacecraft without any human intervention. And it has to be that way because when you're close to the spacecraft, the, close to the space station, uh, the only people we want talking directly to the spacecraft to command it are the astronauts. Why? Because if they see something wrong, they need the ability to hit a button and have us fly, fly away. But we don't want to be in the, we're not in the control center with a joystick flying Cygnus. It's doing it all on its own. Around the spacecraft, we have 32 uh, seven-pound thrusters that do the attitude control of the spacecraft. Uh, we also have one additional big thruster, which is hard to see here, a very high thrust thruster that we use to raise the orbit because it's, uh, it's more efficient. But when we want smaller uh, fine control, we use the 32 thrusters around the, uh, around the spacecraft. It has a lot of redundancy, meaning that we can, we can accommodate all sorts of failures in the system and still have both an operational, but most importantly, a safe spacecraft. So we have four computers on the spacecraft all operating independently. They're all taking the data from the sensors, crunching the numbers, and this computer says, I want thrusters five, seven, and nine to thrust, to thrust for one second. Well, it compares that solution to all the other four computers, and they should all agree. They're all getting the same data. The spacecraft hasn't changed. And what we do that for is so that if one computer says, I want to fire thruster 11 for six seconds, the other guys vote them out, sort of like Survivor on, on a spacecraft. Um, but we, we have multiple uh, strings in, on the spacecraft so that if we have multiple failures, we can still get away from the space station um, safely. So that's the, that's the space vehicle. Uh, we can carry about up to 3,500 or maybe even a little bit more kilograms of cargo in that, uh, in that cargo module. Um, it's fully human rated, which means it has the safety systems in, uh, embedded in it so that it can be around people in space and be safe. Uh, just a couple of uh, more things about it. So we actually have flown two different versions of Cygnus. The standard version, which is a smaller version on the left, and then the enhanced version. This is a rendering, but you saw a picture before of the actual spacecraft. We originally planned this uh, evolution uh, of the cargo module, but we hadn't originally planned was the evolution of some other systems on the spacecraft, where after we flew it the first couple of times, we realized there were some efficiencies we could take in the system. And so you can see the solar rays are different. Um, we, had, we changed out some sensors on the service module. We also figured out a better way of packing the cargo. 
So the original plan is that this would hold about 2,000 kilograms, and the bigger module would hold about 2,700 kilograms. But after working with NASA and the Italians who build the cargo module, we figured out how to more efficiently pack it. And so we got a 30% or so increase in packing efficiency, and now we can fly 3,500 kilograms. On the next contract, we're actually increasing that a little bit more where we can uh, pack almost 3,800 kilograms. So we're slowly making improvements um, and, and doing that because that's, that's our job, to make the system as efficient and effective as possible. The solar arrays generate about 3.5 kilowatts of power. Uh, that's plenty for the Cygnus spacecraft. Um, we carry about 900, maybe a little bit more, 950 kilograms of fuel. So what that enables us to do is do all the orbit raising. It enables us to rendezvous with the space station. And if something were to go wrong, we could actually fly away and then come back. We have enough fuel to do that multiple times just in case something happens. Why would we fly away? Maybe we had a failure, as I just described, and we lost two strings of our system, and we're not safe, and we need to reintegrate those systems into the spacecraft. Maybe we had a late sensor failure. Um, maybe the crew, which is, which is watching Cygnus approach the space, space uh, station, isn't comfortable with where it is. Maybe it's outside the little uh, window box that they're looking at, and so they want to send it away. Well, we don't want just one shot at it. We want mul multiple shots, and so we have enough fuel to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, just a little bit uh, about the, the cargo module, you can see the volume. So the bigger module is about 26 uh, cubic meters, relatively large. When you go stand inside it, as I've had the privilege to do, um, it, is, it is big, um, and we're actually using that for, hopefully, the future of uh, human exploration. Uh, but when you put all the things in it to, to, to uh, lock down the cargo, and we have a fan to circulate air inside the module, when it's on the space station, we can actually carry powered payloads. So we do run power to that module. We have ex uh, biological experiments on this, this next mission going up, so we have to keep those powered so they stay cool and at the right temperatures. Um, and as I mentioned, this comes from Italy, and we actually, d the, the cargo module and the spacecraft service module never see each other until they actually get to the launch site. And that's when we make them together, and you'll see that uh, in just a little bit. So I do have some pictures to share. Uh, this is Cygnus mated to Antares. This was our recent mission in October on OA-5. We do it horizontally. Uh, Atlas does it vertically. Doesn't matter. We can do it either way. Um, and you can see some of the folks there. This is right before the fairing was installed over uh, the spacecraft and before we got rolled out to the launch pad. Uh, it was a beautiful night launch. Uh, the OA-5 was our return to flight mission on Antares after the failure in 2014. Uh, this was their, their return to flight mission. The engines performed flawlessly. We actually got better performance than we expected. And the solid motor, which was its first flight, uh, also performed extremely well. And the mission went, went very well. I've got a little movie to show you in a minute. But uh, nighttime launch out of the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia uh, is, is absolutely stunning. Uh, that's not the only thing we launch. Uh, out of there. We also launched some other smaller solid uh, um, rockets, both, in, both got, go to orbit but also suborbital rockets for NASA. Uh, this is a picture of OA-5 as it's rendezvousing with the space station. So I said, it, I mentioned it takes about a day and a half to three days. It depends on where the space station is when we launch. I think this took about two and a half days. We always rendezvous with the space station in the wee hours of the morning in Virginia, which is where we're based. Uh, because that's when the astronauts are up. They, they go on uh, uh, UTC or, or Greenwich Mean Time. Um, so we're, uh, we're there in the wee hours of the morning, but there's nothing better than to, to be in the control center and watch your spacecraft. Uh, first, you start to see the lights, and then you start to see the sun glint off the solar rays and off the cargo module, and then you can actually see the spacecraft. Now, I've had the privilege of launching many spacecraft in my career. The ability to see the spacecraft again after it launched is very, very special. You never see that. You, you've always they've gone off the rocket, and you know they're there through the telemetry you get, but here you can actually see the spacecraft. And I can promise you, in every case, it's looked just like when we launched it. Nobody messed with it once it got in orbit. <laughs> so we get, uh, you can see it coming up, and, and everybody's getting excited, but we have a full team of, of uh, engineers on console at our mission control center, also at our Dulles facility, uh, and we're monitoring everything. Uh, all the telemetry, temperatures, attitude control, are there any failures? Uh, if they are, what are we going to do about it? At the same time, we're sending all the exact same data to NASA in Houston, and they're looking at all the data. And so we have this check and balance of 
orbital ATK team looking at it, NASA's looking at it, and that's what enables them to give us the go or no-go, should that be the case, once we, uh, once we get close to the space station. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. You can see in the lower picture uh, the robotic arm uh, ready to capture us. We have, a cam we have cameras on the spacecraft, so you can, we can see what's going on. Uh, these pictures are taken, with they're called rocket cam. Uh, one's from what we call the far field, and in the lower right you can see as we're approaching the space stations, we're coming up from below. We don't get these pictures real time. We're actually recording all of that. We use it afterwards for situational awareness. Should there be a problem, we want, it, we want the, uh, the video. But uh, so far, we've just used them uh, for a lot of data gathering and actually a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's, it's just very cool. Um, here's uh, just a few more pictures as we're grappled. So you can see in the upper left, the spacecraft is grappled at the back of the vehicle. Um, on the upper right, probably my favorite picture ever of Cygnus, given the darkness of space behind it and the solar cells and the orange of the material and the, and the solar rays um, were grappled. And then on the, on the bottom right center, you can see where we're attached to the space station. It's called being birthed. But you can see the Soyuz vehicles um, uh, over to, uh, to the right. Um, at any one time, they've had many vehicles attached to the space station. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I believe it was OA-4. We had Cygnus. We had a Dragon from SpaceX. We had multiple Soyuz. We had a Progress. And so it was a busy time. Uh, interestingly, uh, traffic management, which is what NASA calls the process of managing which vehicles come and go at what point, is actually quite complicated. Uh, there are there are stay-out uh, zones on the calendar for when a Soyuz is coming up or going down, or a Cygnus is going up or coming down. Uh, and I, I'm part of that process, or, or I have been, uh, because it's, it's actually quite complicated. And it all is based on not only the vehicles coming and going, but when they need the cargo and how much cargo they need uh, and things like that. So it's actually uh, fun to take part in that. And one last, uh, maybe, it's my, maybe this is my favorite picture. I don't know. Maybe my second favorite picture. I, I put this in here because... Uh, has anyone heard of the, the website Gizmodo? Uh, Gizmodo named Cygnus the cutest of the cargo vehicles out there. <laughs> this is a source of great pride for Orbital ATK, uh, but we also think it's very well deserved. I mean, look at that. I mean, that's what's <laughs> cuter than that. Uh, so anyway. Uh, and then this is Cygnus upon departure, so we get let go and we fly away. And, um, and then we start to do some cool things. So I'm going to show you, oh, we have monitored the reentry. Uh, we do, we have our destructive reentry. We do not return cargo uh, to the Earth uh, like SpaceX does. What that does is enable us to bring up a lot more pressurized cargo. So that's our job. NASA gave us that job. They gave different jobs to SpaceX. Um, what do we carry up there? A lot of scientific experiments. Uh, there's a vaccine experiment. This is Rick Mastracchio. Uh, astronaut, he was on our Orb 1 mission, grappled us, he's doing an experiment there. Uh, over here, there's the Sphere Slosh experiment. They, they put liquid in them and they, they shoot them around the space station. Well, maybe that's a little strong, but they, they, they fly around the space station in zero gravity and they test the, ability, the uh, effects of slosh on propulsion and things like that. And then one of our proud moments here are the ants. We flew ants on our Orb 1 mission. Uh, the Orb-1 mission was supposed to fly in December of 2013. Uh, there was a problem on the space station. They delayed us to January. Well, we had already loaded the ants on the vehicle. So we had to roll the spacecraft back to the horizontal integration facility, take the ants off, fly them. This is no joke. Fly them to, to uh, Colorado. They put more food in. They flew them back to Wallops <laughs> Island. We put them back in the vehicle, and, and they were the happiest ants uh, that ever flew in space. <laughs> Interestingly, they needed, they needed some ants on the ground to help with the controls, um, and they looked around wallops. Again, this is true, and they, they found ants of the same species, and so they gathered up some ants, and they put them in a jar, and, and they became the ground control ants. So, so <laughs> the, the ants are stars of, uh, of, our, uh, of our history of delivering, delivering cargo, and we're really proud of that. Uh, Sapphire is an experiment that we have been flying. This will be the third time we fly it on this next mission. This is by NASA Glenn. So imagine you're on a trip to Mars and a fire breaks out in the spacecraft. Well, you can't just abandon the spacecraft like you could do in the space station. 
knowing how fire propagates and how flame propagates and how combustion works in microgravity is extremely important. So NASA Glenn devised the Sapphire experiment. We loaded his cargo, but it stays in the cargo module after everything else is taken away and all the trash is put in. Uh, and then we fly away, and then we actually fire off sapphire, and there's a fire in the cargo module. And we know it's because the smoke alarms are going off and the temperatures are going up, and it's very cool. It's controlled, but it's very smoky and all sorts of other good stuff. So they burn the stuff, uh, the material, whatever they're testing, and they take all sorts of measurements, and then we downlink the data, and then they take that to figure out how fire is going to propagate microgravity. And so we've flown two of them, and in each case, they've learned enough from each experiment to make the next experiment even better. So we're, we're proud to be part of that. We're, we're flying it for a third time in our mission, which is going to launch in the next, uh, next couple of weeks. Um, we also deploy little CubeSats right off of the Cygnus spacecraft. For the first few missions, we delivered them to the space station, and they would deploy them. Well, now, uh, for the past couple of missions, we've actually launched CubeSats right off of Cygnus. These are satellites about this big and maybe three inches square, and they're uh, of various sizes. They perform various tasks. Um, and you'll see in the movie that I'm going to show in a minute, the, the, the satellites flying out of their, their deployer. You can see the picture on the lower right. Uh, and that's done for NASA via a company called NanoRex. So I'm going to talk over this video quickly. Uh, this is the service module at our facility in Dulles, uh, getting prepped for shipment to Wallops. We, sh we uh, ship it by uh, truck. This is showing the on-ground deployment test of one of our Ultraflex solar rays. Uh, we have to have special equipment to do that on the ground since you're, there's a lot of gravity. Uh, since the gravity makes that deployment very, uh, very difficult. Here's a cargo module arriving um, at the launch site from Italy that gets shipped over by boat. Eventually it's loaded with cargo and then mated to the service module, which is happening right here, to create the Cygnus vehicle. And there's a lot of bolts and there's some propulsion lines uh, that we have to hook up. And then it's put into a shipping container and it's trucked from the H-100 building on Wallops Island, uh, on the mainland, over to Wallops Island itself, over to V-55, where we'll actually fuel the spacecraft with its hydrazine uh, and its oxidizer. Uh, here you can see some cargo getting loaded. We, we do cargo loading in three phases. The initial load is about 75% of it. The late load, we call it, is about 20%, and then the final load is about 5%. Here we're in the, uh, uh, in the horizontal integration facility. All the cargo has been loaded. Uh, the spacecraft has been mated to the rocket, and now the fairing uh, is put, put over the spacecraft. And here we are rolling out from uh, the HIF, as we call it, Horizontal Integration Facility, a uh, mile down the road, up the ramp, and uh, the rocket eventually gets uh, transitioned to vertical, getting ready for launch. You can see the water tower in the background, which is part of the deluge system that, that keeps the, uh, the pad cool and also uh, lessens the noise. That's the Mission Operations Center in Houston. Uh, where they monitor uh, Cygnus, and you'll see here in a second uh, the Antares vehicle uh, take off. Uh, it says OA-5 mission summary. Uh, it, we actually put a daylight launch in here because so you could see the rocket take off. It was from a, from a previous mission, but it's about the same. looks the same. Um, let's see. Okay, so the engines ignite, uh, and the rocket takes off. Does a little waggle there on purpose to get it away from the transporter erector launcher, which is the thing that it rolls out to the pad on. And you can see on this mission, we had cameras on the rocket to, to be able to show where it's going. Eventually here in a second, you will see the uh, first stage fall away, and the second stage will uh, ignite. And that stage will take it to, uh, to its proper orbit, where the spacecraft will be separated and then go on its way. Um, and that's the fairing separation, so the protective covering flies away. The second stage motor ignition um, This will be done in a second, and eventually the spacecraft will separate, and you'll, you'll actually see some video of these ultraflex arrays uh, deploying, because uh, they, they sort of come out in a, in a fan like, there you go. And that is from the rocket, another rocket cam on the spacecraft. We put those on for specifically to monitor this deployment in case there was a problem. Um, we haven't had a problem so far, but it's, uh, the pictures are, are cool. I will tell you, this is sped up video. It actually takes quite, quite a long time, and when you've got your manager breathing down your neck waiting to know if the solar ray is deployed. It feels like it's forever. Uh, here's the, so this is a view of what the astronauts see. So if, if Cygnus were to go outside of that square box, the astronauts could press one button and we would fly away and we would come back. And so here you can see, this is a view from the, from the arm. 
onto the grapple fixture. So they grapple us and you can see them moving us here and they berth us to the space station and we become part of the space station. They open a hatch and they'll start taking the cargo out. Now, after all the cargo's out, they start filling it with trash. Why? Because if you lived in a five bedroom house with six people and nobody took out the garbage, it would get pretty bad in there. So, so part of the thing, part of the service we provide is taking away uh, that disposal cargo and it's very important to NASA. This is some video of the, uh, of the Sapphire experiment burning. You can see the material is, is on fire and so that uh, it's taking pictures. Here you can see this NanoRax uh, deployer. There's a CubeSat flying out. Trust me, it's not that close to the solar array, I know. Everybody's heart stops. Um, and then this, uh, I, th I think OA4, we, had, we worked with NASA Ames, we had a, a chase plane follow the reentry of Cygnus. That is the actual vehicle um, reentering the atmosphere. I will tell you, uh, in complete honesty, that is the most bittersweet moment of the mission. That you have this amazingly fine spacecraft who's done its duty, uh, and there's a great sense of pride for that, but it's burning up in the atmosphere. And so uh, it's something we, it's, it's, it's quite a moment for the team. Uh, we do celebrate the success. Um, it's just, uh, it's very special. So um, just a little bit of statistics, because we all like numbers. We've taken up to the space station so far 13,500 or so kilograms of almost 30,000 pounds of cargo. We're going to fly another 3,400 kilograms on the next mission. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing our part to get that cargo up there. The other data on there is how much cargo we've taken away. It's not as much as we brought. Uh, so at some point that math is going to have to get worked out. But because um, uh, whatever goes up is going to have to come down. And then we've got what our missions are coming up. So we've got OA-7 which is on the, just about on the launch pad on April 18th, we expect to launch. Got about 3,400 kilograms. And then this is a notional plan of when NASA will launch these missions. They'll determine when they want them, we'll be ready. Uh, but you can see the rest of our missions are on Antares uh, in various times, and our, we continue to increase how much cargo we're flying on Antares. And then on top of this, we've got six missions on our CRS-2 uh, contract to uh, uh, further support the space station through 2024 and hopefully, uh, hopefully beyond. So I just want to talk briefly and then I have a video on where Orbital ATK wants to go from here. Uh, we are extremely proud, as I mentioned before, to be part of the Human Space Flight Program and being able to support astronauts in the scientific research they're doing in space. But we want to do more. And we want to start supporting NASA on their trek towards Mars and the first step towards Mars, which is cislunar space. Uh, we are part of, uh, we have uh, worked a program called Next Step Phase 1, which is complete, which is conceptual designs of how you would create a habitat in cislunar space. Uh, we are uh, awaiting the turn on of Next Step Phase 2, which takes you from con conceptual design to ground demonstrations and hopefully eventually Next Step Phase 3, where there'll be flight demonstrations of that. We think Cygnus, given its history, given who's built it, given how well it's worked, uh, is a perfect building block to be the uh, to be a, the building block for a cislunar habitat out at the moon and then eventually to Mars. So we've put together a plan which we think uh, over the next uh, less than a decade will have us with Cygnus space vehicle and other vehicles like Orion and other participants out into cislunar space doing scientific research and then eventually on to uh, on to Mars. So let me just show you that here. Highlighting the fact that today we're, we're, we're doing, we're supporting uh, human exploration by delivering cargo to the International Space Station and some of this video or some of the things you've, uh, you've seen before. Um,
So this is what we call the initial cislunar habitat that we think could be based off of, uh, of, of the work we've done with Cygnus so far. The idea here is we would launch that off of an SLS. Of course, Orbital ATK is part of the SLS program with the solid motors. Um, but you would launch this habitat out uh, with this heavy lift rocket out towards the moon. Uh, and what it will eventually become is a place for the Orion, the astronauts on the Orion uh, capsule to rendezvous and have a place to, to, to live and stay and do scientific research for a longer period of time than if to just go out in, uh, in the Orion itself. The idea being that once once their work is done, they will go back in their Orion capsule, they'll, those, those astronauts will come home, and then that module will stay out there. Eventually, it'll become a building block of, um, of a bigger, a bigger a vehicle, a bigger uh, habitat that's out there that not only are for, for the astronauts to stay and live, but also to do additional scientific research. Um, uh, places where we can add nodes to it, so you can then attach different different devices, whether it's a lunar lander uh, or a scientific research module or things like that. Um, and so everything here is, is lined up with the, the, the current plans for exploration with Orion and the work that Lockheed Martin is doing on Orion, uh, the, the SLS work, of course, that NASA is doing. And you can see here where we've, we've now rendezvoused and met up with that initial cislunar habitat, added another module so now the crew can do even more work out there. And out in the 2024 time frame, we just keep adding modules so that as the crews are making their way out uh, to that cislunar space on a regular basis as we start to, start to really gear up on what, what we plan to be eventual trip to Mars, um, you'll, you'll end up with this space station around cislunar, um, around cislunar uh, orbit. And then as we get, you know, a little bit of a decade or so, um, uh, it's, it's building, a, you can see a, a Mars lander potentially attached to it. Uh, that's just, of course, a notional concept. The idea is that it gives you the flexibility uh, to do things out beyond low Earth orbit that we're just thinking about now. And this is really what's important for all of us to be involved in, in human spaceflight. Uh, I have been involved in this now for the past seven or eight years, and, and it has been a highlight of my career. Um, it's really up to us to get out there and, and push, push NASA, push the government to, to get moving, to pick the destination and get out there uh, as quickly and as safely as we can. And then eventually the idea is you can build this station up and using all sorts of different new technologies, eventually push that station towards Mars. So. I really appreciate your uh, your attention. I uh, really love being here. I can't wait to t walk more about the walk more about the uh, the exhibit. And thank you very much for your attention.
Take the closer look. Awesome! We can take a picture of it too.